I know, there we go. Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the first Teacher Entrepreneurship Week interview. This is actually taking place in advance, so it probably won't be the first one that you viewers see, but Sylvia Tolosano is here, and she's agreed to let me interview her early because she won't be available next week. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you. Camera to switch back to me. How okay. are you? Where are you? I am. Where I, am I? I am in Florida currently, so um, just enjoying still the end of the summer here. Nice. Okay, this is going to be a short interview. It's 15 minutes. We're going to get to know a little bit about you. I'm going to talk about teacher entrepreneurship. Sylvia Rosenthal, Rosenthal Tolosano is a third culture kid, born in Germany, raised in Argentina, having lived shortly in Brazil. We share that Brazil. I don't know if you remember that connection. And she's now planted in the United States. Her multicultural upbringing fueled her interests, which included globally connected learning, technology integration, contemporary upgrades and amplification of the curriculum, documenting for learning. Blogging is pedagogy, visualized learning and developing and maintaining a personal learning network. She's known in the international blogosphere under the name of languages. So do you remember the phrase you used to describe teacher entrepreneurship? I do. I do. It's, um, it's for me, it's the realization really that, um, that the middleman is gone. So that's really interesting. What do you mean by the middleman? Um, lots of different things. I mean, um, I mean for students that they have to learn or they can learn only when a teacher is there. So the teacher is the middleman who is transferring the knowledge to the students. Um, I mean it for teachers that the middleman is gone, that they can they don't have to wait until their school district or wh whomever is responsible to uh, hire trainers for them or send them to a conference. That the middleman is gone, that they are in charge of their own learning and um, are capable of of making these connections, and um, and it also to me the middleman is gone in the sense of I don't need an editor to tell me that what I'm writing is good enough to be published or that, um, that I am able to, uh, to connect with people from all around the world, that um, there is somebody in the middle um, who will first select if I'm capable or if, it, um, if they will allow me to make those connections. It's gone. It's up to me where I want to learn, how I want to learn, with whom I want to learn. So, so that's what I think what the middle the middleman is. So that feels both empowering and scary. Did you go through either of those stages as it as the middleman started to leave for you? Um, I don't think I ever was scared. <laughs> I'm even surprised that you, you, you mentioned that I don't um, I don't consider that scary. To me it's um, I don't know maybe it's because just the way that I grew up that nothing ever was um, already prepared in a box for me that worked for me. So I always, um, I grew up knowing that I had to work around it anyway. So um, no, I don't think it's scary. Um, I did go through, I think, through stages um, of that realization, like I said, to me, that we're even under, understanding, wow, it works. <laughs> it actually works. Um, I don't need a ton of money to do this. It's free. I can't believe it. So yeah, I did go through those stages. Um, and I'm continuing to, to continuing to be surprised when I, for example, I work with students and um, we're working with a um, with a particular tool or so, and the kids are really frustrated because something doesn't work. And um, and I say, hey guys, what are we going to do about it? I mean, how are we gonna, how are we going to work around it? And in the end, we you know together we figure out, you know what? Let's just get directly in contact with the company. How do we do that? Well, let's see if they have a Twitter account. Let's tweet them. And then, surprise, surprise, two hours later, they answered our request and changed the entire platform just to accommodate um, those students. So I'm still surprised at that when it happens, that, um, that it works. There's, there's no middleman. We have direct, uh, direct connection. It, it still feels to me like some educators watching this will feel scared. They'll say, this is more than I sort of signed up for. Uh, how do I even start? So can you tell a little bit of your own story? Sort of as the, uh, do you, can you, how many years can we go back here and sort of talk about sort of the, the technological changes that shifted in, 
and sort of remove that middleman? I think um, from in my story, um, it goes back to 2006 when I started to blog. And, um, and back then I was a Spanish teacher and um, I was the only Spanish teacher in my entire school, um, a private um, K through six school. And um, I didn't have t a team meeting. Um, I was not part of the up and down meetings. I, wasn't, I did not have a subject area team that I could be talking to. Um, I, was, I was isolated, I was by myself. And um, when I started to blog and I started to read other blogs, I suddenly figured, oh, I'm not alone. And I do have a team here. And, um, and then just the act of starting to share, to share what I was doing, to share what I was learning, to share what I was experimenting in my class uh, with technology. I think that that's where I first started realizing it, that um, I don't need anybody to, to do this for me. I can do this myself. And I can get make these connections with other teachers, although they might not live in the same zip code as I do. So for a lot of uh, teachers, it started with blogging, but then sort of quickly moved to the more social tools. Uh, I, I can remember when social networking was viewed with such disdain. And it, do you remember those times when when trying to convince people that social networking would actually be po a positive influence in education was really difficult. But now yes. we have Twitter and we have all kinds of sort of microblogging to many other collaborative tools. Is blogging still the way that you encourage people to start? Um, I encourage, if, if they're natural writers, I do encourage them to start just for their own reflection purposes. And, um, and, but, you know, but, but if that's not the case, if for them, it's really a big birth to, to, to write a blog post that it would take forever, perfectionism takes over, um, then I, I, I am more, um, more steering them towards Twitter, microblogging, 140 characters or less, that it, it is easier. It's, um, you can build a network faster and, um, and connect with more people in, in shorter amount of time. Are there so, other are there other tools that you recommend? Um, well, I mean, f f to create a network, um, those would be the two main ones. To work with other people, um, the tools that that are essential for my my, my collaboration with others are, um, are Google uh, Google Apps. So just the ability to share documents, to, to, to write together, to, to create projects together, to stay in touch no matter where you are in the world. Um, and, and then obviously the video conferencing tools like Skype or Google Hangout. Those are the ones that I, I, I recommend that teachers have a certain, um, not just basic skills, but really work towards gaining fluency um, to, which is a big difference of just being able to to say a few words, have being that being the skill, towards being fluent in using them. Meaning, it's not something that is a roadblock, or you do um, it's um, you do. I, I would say you use it unconsciously and uh, and smoothly. So um, so that's really the goal. I think one of the interesting things about Google Drive or the Google Tools, the collaborative tools is the way that they create a shared filing system. Right? So it's this ability to sort of gather data together with someone in, in addition to being able to working on a document together or a spreadsheet. I'm intrigued by the degree to which just a common filing system makes difference. Yes. To um to be able to to create folders, to be able to to tag and categorize and find things. Um, Another thing which I think it's part of the Google Apps is the crowdsourcing capabilities of, of creating forms and bringing in new kind of data from so many other people. So um, those, those are all tools that I would suggest that their teachers, if they're just starting out, to, to really take a look at and, and practice using them and seeing how they are, their, own, um, their own fluency increases. So the word entrepreneurship has several connotations, one of which is the act of creation, someone who sort of moves the rock up the hill and creates something brand new. Another is a, to a little bit to a degree of isolation, right, of doing something that other people don't understand and starting something. Um, is entrepreneurship a good term 
for what we're describing here as proactive, the proactive process of teacher creation and participation. Where does it? Where does the word entrepreneurship work, and where does it maybe fall short? I think when I when I first hear about the uh, the word entrepreneurship, I think business. I think opening up, uh, being an entrepreneur, is to create your own business, and um, so maybe it. Um, I think it, it requires a little bit more explanation if we're putting this in context um, uh, for teachers. And, um, but then at the same time, uh, the idea of, yeah, we are, we are creating, um, we are in the business of learning. So, so I think that it is, I think it's a good, it's a good, um, it's the same thing. Maybe the word branding brings out um, the idea of that businesses are usually branded, not individuals. And, um, and make, maybe that's part of the transformation that we have to really just be aware of and continue to, to explain and to share and bring that word into the mainstream that it's not just for businesses. So there must be a balance, right, between the active teacher as a mentor and uh, someone who encourages and cares for individual students in their own growth and the teacher as agent and uh, proactive visible uh, collaborator in a personal learning network how do you keep a balance between those two worlds one of which feels like it's very one-to-one -one and very private and the other feels very public I, I think that I think it's it's um, it's a workflow between both of them. So when I, I work with students, um, if I share what I how I work with them, what I when I share and amplify their their work with a global audience with my network, um, I. I not only, f which is personal, I use my blog, I use Twitter to reflect on what I'm doing, to leave breadcrumbs of my work in the sense of where, uh, what research am I doing, what background information do I have, this is, this is what I'm trying out with them, these are the results, this is how I'm going to continue to tweak it. So it's, it's personal because it's my own learning, uh, learn flow, but at the same time, because I'm making it visible to others, through publicly and transparently, I maybe I, I, even unwillingly in the beginning, I became a mentor for others because of the, the, the ability to make it visible, my journey, making it visible for others to, to see that it is doable. And this is how I did it. And if you want to follow my footstep, you're more than welcome to do that. So I think it, it has blended those two, those two distinct parts. For me, it, it is, has become one workflow which is my personal learn flow and then the, being the coach and mentor to others. There must also be an element here of, of modeling. I think you're alluding to that, right? That students are moving into a world in which they have to navigate the same tension between <clears throat> what do I do for my own personal growth and, and sort of private processes and what do I put out publicly. Uh, I think it was, um, I'm not going to, oh, Dana Boyd. You know, who early on said that the, the voice that you use on the internet is most like the voice of um, people who are famous because you're speaking in a single voice that goes out to multiple audiences and all of a sudden it kind of changes how you speak. So are, are you sort of modeling for students how to navigate a world in which you're at one and the same time speaking to lots of different audiences but also trying to make sure you're growing personally? Absolutely. Um, I am... 100% convinced that um, teachers have to experience um, experience different new forms of t of learning in order then to be able to translate that into the classroom and and facilitate and help students with that. And the modeling part, it's to me, it's essential because it tells you so like I I went through this. I you know I've um, I've had this experience. So um, absolutely, it's um, the modeling. I don't think, you know, I say, um, you know, in my area of, um, of passion about globally connected learning, it's if you want globally connected students, you have to be a globally connected teacher. So um, the modeling part is essential. Okay, in our final moments, one book recommendation. <laughs> 
one book recommendation. Oh, let me see. Let me look at all my books here. Um, well, obviously, many books, um, many books to choose from right now. Um, uh, the book that I'm I'm really into and um, and working and working through. Let me see if I can give you a visual on that one. Is the Doodle the Doodle Revolution? Um, I'm really looking at at sketch noting, at sketch noting for learning, at sketch noting um, as documentation um, reflect a uh, reflection tool um, uh, for note taking. So for all different, so that would be currently my recommendation um, to take a look at. Nice. What about one education thinker that people maybe don't go back to, but you feel like really we should be looking at again? Go back to well, or someone that you know. Are you a Maria Montessori fan, or um, uh, is it um, is there somebody that you sort of use as a touchstone thinker for pedagogy and thinking about teaching and learning? Well, um, one of my my mentors um, is Heidi Hayes Jacobs. So um, she's she's been around for many years in the area of curriculum mapping, but is really has grown. Um, in 2010, that's when I became, um, I, I read her book, Curriculum 21. And, um, and I was like, this is it. This is somebody who is taking um, their work that o over decades and is upgrading and is, is changing and looking and, and saying that, you know, we have to, we have to um, throw things out. We have, to, um, we have to decide what we're going to keep and we need to know what we're going to upgrade to, to prepare those kids. Nice. Okay, any final piece of advice for teachers who are wanting to become teacher entrepreneurs? Um, sh uh, share. I think that's the that's the biggest hurdle in the beginning is that that fear maybe here that that's where the fear comes in. Um, again, I didn't feel it, but I know it exists. Um, the fear of being transparent and sharing even your failures. That there's a community out there that we all can benefit from each other and um, and really also document the good work that's happening in all, in all these classrooms and um, and making that visible to others. Sylvia, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> Have a great week. Take you care. too. Bye. Okay, you too. Bye, Steve.